It's very nice that you've all come here this evening, despite the in quite strong rain. We're reminded of the story of Bilva Mangal Thakur, who prior to becoming a devotee, went through the rain and so many difficulties to reach his girlfriend. We shall have to go through many difficulties if we are to attain the lotus feet of Krishna. Actually, there is no difficulty. Uh, but because we are attached to this material world, that becoming free from those attachments, we perceive it as difficulty. Otherwise, the jiva is simply meant to be happy in the service of the supreme happy Lord Krishna. This evening, we are going to discuss Sankirtan. We are just saying how the jiva is naturally happy in the service of the supreme happy Krishna. And that happiness is expressed by Sankirtan, by glorifying Krishna. In the Brahma Samhita, we find a description of the spiritual world. Kathaganam natyam gamanam apivangshi priyasakhi. That all speaking is singing, all walking is dancing, and the uh, ever present is the dear companion, the flute of Krishna. A walking, uh, 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 talking is singing because if one is very happy then he doesn't just talk he, he sings or uh, another consideration is, is if someone's speech is very beautiful it sounds like song there must be some Tamil poets like that or they, they speak and it sounds very beautiful is it? nowadays they wouldn't know because it's movie culture not poetry culture so, in the spiritual world, the, the mode, just the sound of the speech is, is so beautiful that it sounds like singing. Everything is spoken in a melodious, poetic way. Just, just like this, Prabhupada in this regard quoted one verse from Srimad Bhagavatam. Samashutaye padda pallava plavang mahat padang punya yashomara re. What's the next line? Vatsa padang 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 yadva padang nate sham. That uh, Prabhupada just quoted and said, just the sound of it is so beautiful. Just like we, we have Bhagavad Gita, means that what Krishna spoke to Arjuna is beautiful both in its content and its style of presentation. Sometimes here in South India, people are surprised when they hear our kirtan. In here they are more used to the formal offering of prayers to, to the Lord. So that is also a form of kirtan. But when that, uh, that kirtan means to praise the Lord, that how He is so wonderful, there are so many prayers. And the devotee feels happiness by offering such prayers. And the Lord feels happy to receive such prayers. One name of Lord Vishnu is Stavapriya, one who is, he, he likes to hear the Vedic hymns, the stavas, the stutis recited in his prayers. So when the, this offering of prayers, it's not simply a formality. It may be said in a formal manner. One can just say because, well, it's said in, at this time you should say this prayer, and then you just say it. But if the prayer is said with much feeling, then certainly the Lord is very pleased. So when that feeling of offering prayers with awe and reverence to the Lord, when that feeling is increased more and more and more, then it is expressed as singing in Kirtan. Which is not as formal as offering prayers. But the lack of formality is also, uh, that is natural in the expression of great love and great happiness. That, that the offering of prayers is not so much dependent upon form, but it's more uh, on strictly reciting according to meter, but it's more concerned with the feeling or the bhav of the devotee. Of course, in music there is form also. If, if you don't play the instruments in time, then it doesn't sound nice at all. There is a whole tremendous science of music. 
And that is all meant for glorifying Krishna. Music that is used for satisfying the senses is not at all proper. We find in Bhagavatam that Narad Muni in his previous life was, in a previous life was, was a Gandharva, who Gandharva means highly gifted in singing and music. Someone who is born on this earth, with, who is very talented in music, we can understand that in a previous life they were a Gandharva. One of the most famous musicians of the Western world, Mozart, had said that he could play the violin at the age of three. And uh, one of the most famous musicians in the Western world of the modern age, who was uh, personally, he, he personally came in contact with Srila Prabhupada, uh, this John Lennon, Prabhupada said that he was a Gandharva in his previous life. So Narad Bodhi was a Gandharva in a previous life and he was called to an assembly of the demigods to sing. But instead of singing songs in glorification of the Supreme Lord, he sung some ordinary songs for sense gratification. And thus he was cursed to fall from his position and become a Shudra. But in the modern age, all the songs are suitable only for Shudras, only for sense gratification. And the influence of that, we hear that and we, we, if we hear that, we become inclined towards sense gratification. Music is very powerful, has a powerful influence on the consciousness. There's all different kinds of music. There's music for waking people up very gently. There's music for marching to war. The sound of the music will encourage the soldiers, yes, let's go and fight. <coughs> music can in inspire us for uh, sense gratification. But actually music is meant to be engaged in the service of Lord Krishna. Saraswati, she is the wife of the Lord and she is the personality who oversees and inspires glorification of the Lord through music. She's also the goddess of learning. This uh, students, they do Saraswati Puja so that they can get her blessings for uh, becoming successful in their studies. But that Saraswati who they worship is the external manifestation of Saraswati. She awards success in mundane music and mundane knowledge. But Shuddha Saraswati, the wife of Lord Narayan, she uh, has no other function but to glorify the Lord and to help others glorify Him. So she's the goddess of learning, means that the that learning and music or kirtan are non-different. That the same point or the same function is served by learning and is served by kirtan. One who is actually learned, one who knows what is the actual fact of existence, he must engage in kirtan, glorification of Krishna. And if one engages in kirtan, then all the uh, all knowledge will be revealed to him. Without engaging in kirtan, no one can understand anything. What what is actual knowledge? Sri Krishna Sankirtanam is vidyavadhu jivanam. It is the life of transcendental knowledge which is just like the, uh, it's here described as the wife. So Saraswati is the wife of Lord Vishnu and she, she is knowledge of him, she is glorification of him and she gives knowledge of him and she inspires the glorification of him. Hmm. Therefore Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati. The, the two names are the Bhakti Siddhanta and Saraswati. They're actually synonyms and they indicate a uh, person who is always engaged in kirtan, specifically sankirtan. Kirtan and sankirtan mean the same thing, but sankirtan means, some, this prefix means complete. Kirtan means glorification. So, glorifi actual glorification can never be incomplete. If it's incomplete, then it's not actual glorification. 
this devotee is very good, but he doesn't know how to put on tilak properly. And that's not proper glorification. Chidranu sandhan, looking for faults. This is, this is not glorification. So, in the Supreme Lord, there is no fault. So, there is no question of anything but glorification, except by persons who are envious and demoniac. Ka utama shloka gunanavananam puman virajeta vina pashugnat. Who will not engage in the glorification of he who is to be glorified by the topmost verses? Only a person who is a the killer a killer. Not, not a killer meaning total, but a killer. K I L L E R. There's also a killer which means it's one word which means total. But a killer. Pashugnat. Pashugnat, actually. It means one who is engaged in killing himself by uh, adopting the Mayavad philosophy or a killer of animals. They, such persons cannot glorify Krishna. So, kirtan is the natural function of the jiva. But in the contaminated state, the conditioned state, we are killing ourselves by not engaging in kirtan. Without proper knowledge of Krishna, we cannot actually engage in kirtan. We may glorify God is the creator of this world. And we think this is glorification. Glory, glory to God on high. Glory to God who created this world and who out of his divine mercy, if you don't believe in him, sends you to burn in hell forever. So this is considered religion by persons who have no actual knowledge of who is Bhagavan. So they, they, all they say, although they say glory to God, their attempts to engage in kirtan are actually insulting. Similarly, we, we hear that many uh, Mayavadis, they also offer prayers to the Lord. But that, even if they recite the same prayers as the devotees do, uh, the, the prayers of the Mayavadis can never be kirtan. They're praying, uh, you are supreme, you are so beautiful, standing with your flute, and thinking that you don't actually exist, you're just a, a transformation of the impersonal Brahman. So one can engage in actual kirtan, which means complete kirtan, if one has first of all heard. First comes shravan, then kirtan. If we are told to glorify God, but we don't, we don't really know what his qualities are, then how can we properly glorify him? For instance, if the prime minister were to come and the school children were told, you should say something in praise of him, but they're not educated as to who he is, they may say, well, all glory is to that man with a blue turban, and that's all. This, our present prime minister mostly wears a blue turban, but that's not... I mean, there are so many people who wear blue <coughs> turbans, but that's not the extent of his glory. He's the Prime Minister. So, it, similarly, we may say, well, Krishna, he plays on a flute, and he's blue, and he's very beautiful. But if we don't understand how he is, Ishvara Parama Krishna Satyarananda Vigraha Anadi Radhi Govinda Sarva Karana Karanam, we may think, well, he's nice, and he, he plays his flute, and, you know, in the movies, they also have people playing on flutes, and Krishna's nice, and the movies are nice also. So we find that it's, it's very common that in India that families, one day they go to the temple all together, and the next day they all go to the cinema together. <laughs> on the other hand, if we have, some, we have a conception of God as the Supreme, but we don't know about his personal features, then we uh, we can't love him. You can, if you don't know actually about his personality, then you can't love him. So hearing must accompany kirtan. Actual kirtan can be executed under the guidance of persons uh, uh, who are engaged in kirtan. In one sense, it's very easy to engage in kirtan. Just open your mouth and say, Hare Krishna. Physically, it's not difficult to do envious nature, they actually can't do it. They can talk for hours about the, how there's no God, but they, it means that the, the function of speech, they, it's there, they have the brain and the tongue and the lips, 
and the, the wind pipe, they have all the apparatus to do it, but they cannot chant the name of Krishna. So, uh, so unless one is very envious, it's easy to chant the names of Krishna. But to actually chant the name of Krishna has got nothing to do with brain, windpipe, tongue, palate, lips, or any of these things. Brain, you got that? <laughs> <laughs> this Golokera uh, Prem Dhan Hari Nama Sankirtan, this chanting of Hare Krishna is a function of the spiritual energy. So we can begin to be admitted to the spiritual energy by the physical representation of the name and which is conducted under the guidance of those who are chant who are actually engaged in kirtan who are connected with the spiritual energy we can actually begin to perform kirtan not simply by interaction of the the tongue and the windpipe but by engaging the tongue the windpipe and all these things under the direction of persons who are actually engaged in kirtan, who are under, who are connected with the spiritual energy, by chanting the names of Krishna under the directions of persons who are connected with Krishna, we can begin to enter the spiritual energy. We get the grace of the, of Krishna that can pull us up. The chanting the name of Krishna is in itself purifying. Uh, if it's conduct again, if it's conducted under the guidance of pure devotees, kirtan or supposed kirtan, which is conducted under the guidance of persons with desires other than to serve Krishna, such chanting will never bring us to Krishna. Such kirtan is not actual kirtan at all. Shadu shonge bhai Krishna nam nahi hoy nam. Akar bahere bate tabu nam kabu nai. Unless one is in the association of and under the guidance of actual sadhus, then one cannot pronounce the names. One cannot actually chant the names of Krishna. Aksharam, the the syllables may be manifest, but that's not. But actually, Krishna, he doesn't manifest. So one can chant the names of Krishna, who is in knowledge of Krishna. Means knowledge that uh, Ishvara, Parama, Krishna, Satyadananda, Vigraha, Anadir, Adir, Govinda, Sarva, Karna, Karnam, and Jivasvaru, Poi, Krishna, Nityadas. In this material world, everything we come in contact with, we try to become the master of it. How I, how I can engage this in my sense gratification. Or if we find something that is not, we, we, we're not capable of engaging in our sense gratification, or if we find something that is a threat to our sense gratification, we try to avoid it or reject it. So we may have this attitude when we come in contact with the name of Krishna also. Sometimes people ask, well, how much do you have to chant to to get liberation? As if it's some kind of formula that you, you do you do it, you get enough you get enough money in your bank balance and then you uh, it's it's like that. You save up enough money and then you can become, I don't know, put, get li in the list of the top 20 people in India or something like this. You get enough points and then you get a, a grade in your exam, then you become qualified to enter the university. But it's not just a matter of uh, routine formula. There's a matter of feeling also. That feeling comes from understanding our relationship as servant of the all-merciful Krishna. So by associating with actual devotees, hearing from them, and engaging in kirtan with them, we can become purified. This uh, hearing and chanting, they are inseparable. There's no actual kirtan without shravan, and there's no actual shravan unless that results in kirtan. So that, sang that kirtan should become complete by our complete dedication to kirtan. Kirtan executed with any other desire than to satisfy Krishna cannot be Sankirtan. Then our motive is not only to glorify, there's some other motive also. Then it's not actual, it's not full Kirtan. So Sankirtan means complete glorification. And 
Sankirtan also means Bahubhya, Miladva, Yadkirtanam, Iti Sankirtanam, when many people come together to engage in Kirtan, that Sangha, that is called Sankirtan. So many persons coming together. This uh, is the recommended process of purification for this Kali Yoga. Kriteya Dhyato Vishnum. In the Satya Yoga, meditation was the standard process for worshipping Lord Vishnu. So Dhyanam and Sankirtanam, they have the same purpose, but in method they are quite different. Meditation means to go away from others and without any disturbance just concentrate the mind. That's why many people, they think they're, they're surprised at Sankirtan. That what, what kind of religion is this? Religion we, means we should be very peaceful and calm. In the early 1980s, I was stationed for some time in Thailand, which is a Buddhist country. And the people couldn't relate at all to monks jumping up and down, playing musical instruments and singing. Because they thought monks should be like the Buddha, just sitting in... <laughs> completely calm. But the dhyana is meant for kriteya uh, dhyato vishnu, meditation on Vishnu. And one who has actually attained perfection in dhyana, he will jump up from his meditation and shout out, Hare Krishna! Then he'll run around to all the other ashrams, run up and down the mountains in the caves and pull all the yogis out and say, Hey, come and join and chant Hare Krishna. <laughs> Actually, chanting the names of the Lord is efficacious in every yoga. But we say that people in Kali Yoga have to chant that because they can't perform meditation, their mind is not peaceful enough. But another perspective is that in Satya Yoga, people are too peaceful to chant Hare Krishna. They think meditation is very dignified and it's very suitable for me. And they feel very satisfied in the mode of goodness and their mind is not disturbed. If, if the mind is, only if the mind is undisturbed can one engage in meditation. But everyone's mind in Kali Yuga is disturbed so no one can engage in this meditational process. And when one's mind becomes very, very disturbed and one is fortunate enough to meet devotees, then he can really chant Hare Krishna so many problems and so many headaches and like Draupadi, Govinda. That's why sometimes in our ashrams we, we see that we think the devotees, well they're not enough, in enough anxiety. We should give them more service and more difficult service. Then they can make more spiritual advancement. <laughs> the, we arrange the ashram so that people can come together and without the disturbance of so many material affairs, peacefully live together and chant Hare Krishna. They come with are, the ashram is there so that people can come and live here and without so much disturbance of material affairs, they can live here peacefully and chant Hare Krishna. But if it's too peaceful, then there won't be any kirtan, and there'll only be snoring. In the material world, there is shrama eva hi kevalam, only hard work for no, for no use. So one should come to the ashram. Ashram does is not ashram. It's ashram, not ashram. Ashram means no work. But ashram means shram, more shram, more work. One should be fully engaged in kirtan. One should enter the ashram for the sake of full engagement in Krishna's service. You may think, well, that sounds a little extreme for me. I think I'll become a Grihastha and get married. Gri uh, actual Grihastha has to enter the Grihastha ashram. And that ashram, that doesn't refer to working hard simply for uh, food, clothing and shelter. But the Grihastha in his Grihastha ashram is meant to engage in Krishna Kirtan. Only his circumstances are different from those of renunciants. So everyone is meant for engaging in kirtan. Everything is meant for engaging in kirtan. Every building, every car, every computer, every pen, everything is meant for in being engaged in Krishna. The printing press is wonderful for kirtan. That the, the kirtan can be expanded. Printing press is being used for the glorification of persons who should not be glorified. 
we should take over all the printing presses in the world. That's what they do in totalitarian governments. Totalitarian, I don't know the Tamil word. No. <laughs> it means like uh, the, the authoritarian. They don't, they don't allow any opposition. Milit Allah. Military government, they control all the TV stations and the radio stations and the, and the press and they don't allow any criticism of the government. Only you should praise. And once in Bangladesh I was printing a book, Bhagavan Eya Katha by Srila Prabhupada. We were printing it with a, a company, Shongbad, means one newspaper, they were printing this book for us. So I went on rickshaw from our ashram and I went past the Bangladesh television headquarters, which is guarded by army staff, by yeah. soldiers. It's a, guarded by army soldiers. Because if there's any attempted revolution, then they want to keep... The first thing the rebels want to do is take the TV and the radio and incite the people to join their revolution. And the, the government want to keep it to tell that you, you kill all these rebels. Join People join with us. So in this way they want to control the people. So I came into the uh, Shongbad printing press and it was 10 o'clock in the morning and I found all, all packed high with newspapers. I said, what happened? You didn't distribute your papers today? He said, no, the government stopped it. There was something they didn't like in it, so they, we couldn't distribute today. Yeah. So the government wants to control the media because they, in this way they want to control the minds of the people. At the present time, the media of the world is controlled by uh, Rakshasas. Rakshasa means they like to they live on human blood. So, uh, those who are controlling the media, probably most of them are not engaged in drinking human blood, but they are sapping the spiritual life of the people by uh, feeding them all rubbish, especially this uh, pornography business. Why should any government allow this? It's so degrading. There are very few governments who, who disallow it. You think, well, it's the right of the people. If they want to see all this, they can see this. But it totally pollutes the consciousness. But it's a big business and money is all people care about, it seems. This internet was developed uh, with so, so much intelligence and endeavor. And they were thinking, well, this will lead to the, the massive dissemination of knowledge and this will uplift the human condition. But the main use of the internet and the biggest business on the internet is pornography. That's why in America, well, recently in America, some Orthodox Jewish community, they have banned any people that you cannot, if you want to be a member of this community, you cannot keep the internet in you, no access to this is allowed in your home because your children will be spoiled. They understand that this is, uh, this is so damaging to the children. Of all the religions in the world, the Hindus seem to care least about all these kind of things. Deeply polluted by Advaita Vad, they think everything's okay. So it's very much needed that those who know how to use, how to utilize everything in the service of Krishna, they dictate what goes on in human society. There is tremendous opportunity to glorify Krishna through the printing press, through the internet, through music, through song, through dance but it is being misused. So those who have understood what is kirtan, they must engage their lives in amplifying the kirtan. Srila Prabhupada's spiritual master, Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati, he was much dedicated to the amplifying kirtan through the Brihat Madanga, the press. He considered writing books and publishing them more important than establishing temples and creating neophyte devotees. He also established many muts, uh, but he would call them Vani Hatta to complement the, the Nam Hatta established by Nityananda Prabhu. 
who very widely distributed the holy names of Krishna. And Bhakti Siddhan Saraswati, he wanted to establish these mats for that kirtan should go on constantly, especially by Hari Katha Kirtan, speaking topics of Lord Hari. And his kirtan was um, mostly by this Hari Katha. Of course, all his Katha was meant to lead people to chant the names of Krishna. But again, to actually chant, one has to receive the Vani. Vani is, of course, also a name of Saraswati. So this, uh, he in one lecture he spoke that this, this, yeah, how the, how the devotees are, as I was saying, they're performing kirtan by speaking. Some are perform, some are performing kirtan by doing the accounts. Some are performing kirtan by cleaning the temple floor. Everything is meant for kirtan. And some are transcribing the lectures and printing them so that people in future can also take advantage of this kirtan. Srila Prabhupada said that uh, I received Krishna consciousness from my father, his father, Gaur Mohande. But the special thing I learned from my Gurudev was this book production. He, Srila Prabhupada observed that his Gurudev was very much interested in book production. It was a great triumph for the Gorya Mat that they, they had a, 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 trim, a beautiful marble temple built in the heart of Calcutta. It was like a symbol of the success of the Gorya Mat's preaching mission. But Bhaktisiddhan Saraswati Thakur told Srila Prabhupada, who at that time was householder disciple, that now we have this uh, fancy temple and the men are fighting over the rooms. So I, he said, I think we better if we removed all this marble and sold it and used the money for printing books. This was spoken at Sri Radha Kund, where the, the, the Srila Bhaktisiddhan Saraswati Thakur, a tremendously empowered representative of the Supreme Lord, was speaking to his disciple who, who is also understood by his later activities to be a tremendously empowered representative of the Supreme Lord. At this most sacred place in the universe or even beyond the universe, he didn't speak about how Radha is uh, running with Lalita and Krishna is pulling on Radha's cloth or any such thing. He spoke print books. You may say, well, why didn't he speak Radha Katha? Foolish people who have no understanding of who is Srimati Radharani will think that he didn't speak Radha Katha. Just like foolish people think that there's no mention of Radharani in Srimad Bhagavatam. There's no mention of Radharani in Bhagavatam because there are so many foolish people. Srimad Bhagavatam is not meant for foolish people. Those who are not foolish, they will find in every syllable Srimati Radharani. But to protect from the foolishness of fools, that is not given explicitly, only implicitly. So these uh, two very dear devotees of Srimati Radharani, their discussion was print books. Just like this uh, Gurudas Prabhu who was building the temple, Krishna Balaram temple, in Vrindavan, Iskon Temple. Yeah. He went to meet Prabhupada at the Delhi Palam Airport, which is now called Indira Gandhi Airport. And he was very excited that I'm now, for the first time, I'm going to be with Prabhupada, the topmost devotee in Vrindavan, the topmost place. And he wondered that uh, Prabhupada has just come back from the West and what's he going to say? Uh, Prabhupada, he's going to... He's, going to talk so many wonderful things about Vrindavan. Prabhupada didn't say anything. They were driving from Delhi along the road going to Vrindavan. Prabhupada didn't say anything. Then eventually he said one word, cement. Because at that time there was a shortage of cement and the government was rationing it. And it was very difficult to get the cement to build the temple. So Prabhupada was thinking how to how we shall get the cement to build the temple, to glorify Krishna to the whole world. So some people may criticize, why is he saying cement? Why isn't he saying Radhe Krishna, Radhe Krishna? 
But Prabhupada saying in that circumstance, cement is far more value, is far more pleasing to Krishna and far more spiritually meaningful than millions of Babaji's spending their whole lives saying Radhe Krishna, Radhe Krishna, never leaving Vrindavan. People who are a long way from actual Krishna consciousness, they want it very cheaply. The life of dedication and service that is required to be admitted into Vrindavan, that is known to the pure devotees. Sometimes we think, well, why don't we just make it very easy? But if it's very easy, then there's no bhakti. Bhakti means surrender, dedication. That's why this idea, you, you do a little kirtan, you beg a few chapatis and then you go to sleep. This is not kirtan. Sankirtan means the endeavor to engage everyone in the universe in kirtan. Then there can be actual sankirtan, complete kirtan. And that can be best affected by distributing the kata of pure devotees in the form of these books. We should never underestimate the value of these books. We may think, well, I can go and speak and what do we need these books for? Actually, it's a fact that because there have been so many books of the Christian Conscious Movement distributed throughout the world, that there is now a far more favorable circumstances for speaking Krishna Conscious and being heard. So that compared to previously, it's relatively easy to bring people into Krishna Consciousness. But unless this Sankirtan Yagya of distributing Srila Prabhupada's books goes on, then there will not be actual Sankirtan. Then the, uh, the, the, the preaching will simply degrade into <coughs> collecting heads, collecting followers for the sake of one's own personal glorification. The tendency of the conditioned soul is to want to divert the glorification of Krishna to himself. So sometimes even in the name of glorifying Krishna, we are actually trying to glorify ourselves. We see that those devotees who can continue with th their service of book distribution for years and years, the 30 years, 40 years, they have no other, de they are those devotees who have no other desire than to glorify Krishna. They have understood the importance of glorifying Krishna and they have understood the importance of glorifying Krishna through the medium of his pure devotees uh, pure words collected in his books. This Bhagavad Gita as it is, is extremely potent. We cannot understand how. Because if we read it, it's very difficult to understand. Even after many years, or, or, or relatively many years in the Krishna Conscious Movement, we don't find the Bhagavad Gita a very easy book to understand. The basic principles are not very difficult to understand, but some of the details, just like you find in chapter 13, and they're quite difficult to grasp. But this book, probably more than any other in India and outside India, is changing people's lives and making people devotees. And all these books are very potent. I, I know people who have become devotees from reading the teachings of Queen Kunti and life comes, many from life comes from life. In England, I think it was, many years ago, there was someone walking down the street and he found a piece of paper had got caught on his shoe because because of the, the, the pavement was wet and his shoe was wet and the piece of paper caught on his shoe. So that was disturbing him, so he bent down to pick it up and, and usually you don't look, but somehow he looked and he He's, he read it and he thought, well, oh, that's very interesting. I never read anything like that. And he saw in this uh, little, there's just one little paragraph of writing, it's also said, back to Godhead. He never heard anything like that. Back to God. So audience. it seems that someone had got Back to Godhead magazine and sometimes people in the Western countries, they don't like this. They're very demonic and they may just rip it up and throw all the pieces away. So this person, he got this little piece of it and he thought, this is something, I never read anything like this before. We are not to, meant to live in this material world which is simply full of suffering. We belong in the spiritual world of a, a life of eternal eternity and bliss. 
So he said, I don't know what this means, but it sounds something very interesting. So he cleaned it up and dried it off and kept it in his wallet and looked at it every day. Then some months later, again, he was walking down the street and there was someone dressed in what appeared to him to be very strange clothing and waving some magazines and trying to get people to purchase them. So he rushed past not to be disturbed. No, no, I don't want that. Yes. Just out of the corner of his eye, he, he saw something. What is that? What is that magazine? Back to Godhead? So he purchased. Then his whole life changed. So all auspicious. Distribute these books. They will, they will have their effect. On those who take them, those who distribute them, it's all auspicious. This is the best way to glorify Krishna. The function of the jiva is to glorify Krishna. The best way to do that is to assist Srila Prabhupada in his glorification of Krishna by distributing these books. So, Bharati Rajalu, how many Bhagavad Gita's you distributed today? Four more Bhagavad Gita's. Just see. Empowered by Krishna. <coughs> we might think that our dear friend Varada Rajalu is materially not a very competent person. But Krishna is empowering him to distribute more Bhagavad Gita than anyone else here in Salem. Year after year. And, okay. and he just keeps on doing it. Practically from the time he came. It's, it's his service to distribute Bhagavad Gita. Don't know what he does or how he does it, but regularly distributing these Bhagavad Gita's. He's become... A, he's, by doing so, he's become a worthy servant of Varada Raja. The best gift you can give anyone is knowledge of Krishna. People go to Varada Raj for getting all kinds of benedictions which are not at all helpful to them. But here in Sa they go to Kanchi, but here in Salem, the servant of Varajaraj is coming to them and giving them the best benediction they can possibly get. Is there anyone here who, and who doesn't have Bhagavad Gita as it is at home? Oh, I was going to introduce you to Varadaraj. <laughs> Once they've got Bhagavad Gita, then you have to give them Krishna book also. Then gradually fill up their home. Just like I was, just like I was saying in that uh, newspaper. It was just full up. You could hardly walk yeah. in. It was just full up of all newspapers. So fill your homes and fill your hearts with Krishna Katha. And Varada Rajalu will help you. So I think no one's going to go back tonight. There's too much rain, huh? Yeah. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Anandam buddhi vardhanam pratipadam purnamrita svadhanam sarvatma snaparam param vijayate.